I will give you it. Thank you. Um, I will give you each max 20 minutes to introduce your research. Then we will have for each of you 15 minutes to discuss any way, any style. And unfortunately, at 15 to 7, I will have to leave because I have myself speaking in the final session. And I have not only to switch, but I have also to uh, reconnect my brain to what I could say in the next session. But as you are on the tweet, it will work. Is it okay for all of you? Okay, okay. So we will do in the following order. Jean will be the first. Then we will have Michael. Then we will have Zineb. Is it okay also? Voilà. And discussion is very frank. And we, we are peers, we are friends. So we ask any questions. There is no stupid question. So we start with Jan. Yan is presenting us research with a focus on China's electricity market, but a particular way, efficiency versus equity. Yan, you have the floor. Thank you for your introduction, Professor. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, right. Uh, it is okay. Perfect. Okay. Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Jian Cui, a PhD student from School of Applied Economics, Renmin University of China. And I'm very honored to present uh, our research. The title is Efficiency versus Equity, Evaluating the Impacts of Reforming and Integrating China's Electricity Market. And the co-author is Professor Hao Chen, Professor Feng Song, and uh, Professor Zhu Gaojiang. And Professor Feng Song is my supervisor, and uh, uh, she provided us the idea. And uh, here is the outline of my presentation. In the introduction section, I will present our motivations and the contribution. And in the methodology, I will introduce our research framework and a theoretical analysis of the market reform. And uh, the section three, four, and five, I will present our model, the results, and the conclusion. Uh, first uh, is the introduction. Uh, in, 20, oh, oh. in 2015, a new round of market-oriented reform was initiated in China with one of the goals being to enhance the e efficiency and reduce the pollution and the emissions through establishing a market-based resources allocation uh, mechanism. And the transitioning the Chinese electricity industry from, uh, from planning-based mechanism to market-based mechanism faces many challenges and requires a careful market design. And the majority of China's provinces have achieved some progress in establishing the wholesale market within the provinces. provinces. But the interprovince, uh, but the interprovince electricity trade is also nego negotiated by the government. Uh, used uh, used as a way of uh, ensuring the energy security and for the local economic development. So moving forward, a key step toward reform is determining how provincial market should be integrated across provinces. And uh, there is little known about the effect of the multi marketization reform and the interprovincial market integration on the efficiency gains, the emissions, the benefit distribution between provinces. So our uh, motivation is to uh, quanti is to evaluate the market uh, reform and the market integration. Uh, in the literature review, earlier studies uh, adopt social cost benefit analysis to quantity the potential economic impact of the electricity sector restructuring. But there are uh, emerging but still few quantitative assessment studies on China's new round of market reform initiated in 2015. 
Existing studies cover the impact on the electricity price and the generation cost, the core consumption, but there are uh, still few uh, studies focus on the welfare uh, impact. So our contribution is to provide a comprehensive uh, ex ante impact evaluation study using a partial equilibrium welfare analysis that measure the supply cost, the reduction, and the impact in terms of the price, the social surplus, and the carbon emission. Uh, uh, to enrich the literature by addressing the efficiency, equity, and the environment trade-off in the developing countries. Uh, our advantage is the data set. We have a unique data set of hourly load, uh, the real hourly load and generation for the year. 2018 covering the 5,000 provinces in China, and it will help us to improve the accuracy of the simulation result. And then is the methodology. Uh, this, fig this figure is our research framework. First, we defined three uh, scenarios. The planning scenarios is a, uh, the planning scenarios is a counterfactual no reform scenario. And the provincial and regional market is to market reform in different levels of the marketization and the integration. Based on the scenario, we can use the simulation model to uh, calculate uh, to uh, calculate the generation mix, the interprovincial trade, and the wholesale price. Uh, in the three scenarios. Based on this uh, result, we can further evaluate the carbon emissions, the efficient gains, and the uh, welfare change uh, between the consumers and the producers and among the provinces. So here is the detailed definition of the three scenarios. Uh, the planning scenario is uh, equity-based generation dispatch with uh, provinces specific the, the benchmark on grid tariffs. And the interprovincial trade are scheduled annually with the negotiated fixed price and uh, fixed uh, quantities. And uh, the provincial market is, uh, is a market is uh, from planning scenario to provincial market, it represents the market reform. The each provinces creates their own market and connect to one another through the pre-determined interprovincial trade, which is the same as in the planning scenario. And this provincial market is close to the reality. Uh, in the regional market, the uh, interprovincial trade is, uh, is also uh, considered in the market and determined by a common regional market. So the provincial market, we have uh, five system operators in each provinces. And in regional market, we have a common system uh, operators to uh, dispatch the generation through market mechanism. And uh, here is, uh, and this picture shows the uh, eco share, the eco share plan, plan the dispatch in 2018. It's the, this figure is the installed capacity and the average running hours of whole fab units in the five provinces. You can find that the inefficiency of the central planning production allocation mechanism is very obvious uh, as the higher uh, units have a similar or even lower uh, average running hours than the low efficiencies, the low efficient uh, generators. And then we give a theoretical analysis of the market reform. As, as the picture uh, in this slide, it means the market reform will uh, reduce the, the supply curve because it can improve the uh, allocation efficiency by uh, reduce the gener generation cost. So marketization will shift down the uh, supply curve from S1 to S2. So the impact of the mar market reform will reduce the price from P1 to P2 and uh, increase the total welfare by the area ABC. 
So here is a very uh, simple figure for the theoretical analysis. But let me talk of, of our two strong assumptions based uh, in our studies. The first is the demand curve is completely uh, inelastic and the supply curve is uh, completely competitive in, uh, in our uh, model and in our analysis. And here show the market uh, integration uh, impact on the welfare change. Uh, here is the, the left is the provincial uh, province A and the right is the province B. Province B have a higher uh, supply curve and the province A have a low uh, supply curve. And the intro flows and the, and the intertrade flows from the low cost provinces to high cost provinces will improve the efficiency and the unified price. The total welfare gains from the market integration is the area CEF. And you can see that it also bring a redistribute surplus between the two uh, between the two provinces. The consumer supplies for province A will uh, decrease and the consumer supplies for province B will increase. So it shows that market, market integration will increase, the, uh, compared with the uh, provincial market, will increase the total welfare. But it's also caused uh, a redistrib uh, redistribution effect of the consumer and the producer surplus. And then is our simulation model and the data used in the two market reform. First, uh, the equation one and two is the power generation. In a perfectly competitive market, electricity firms uh, assumed to bid their quantities at a marginal cost where the electricity generation is a decision variable and the production of different technologies at any time is constrained by the install capacity. And uh, equation one is the uh, constraints for the stable power generation include the coal-fired gas, gas and nuclear. And the equation two is for the variable uh, uh, power generation like hydropower, wind, and solar, and biomass. The CF means the capacity factor, which is uh, which shows the how their generation variety uh, in days and uh, across months. And then the interprovincial power trade is constrained by the transmission capacity between the two provinces. And uh, equation four is the hourly electricity market balance for province I, the total power generation plus their net import is equal to the demand at any given hours. So based on, the, based on these uh, constraints, the problem, uh, the sole, uh, the, the problem for the, the, the power dispatch for the system uh, operator is to minimize the total operating cost, including the power generation cost and the transmission cost. In the provincial market scenario, we have five operators to minimize their own uh, provincial operating cost. And in the regional uh, market, scenario, we have a common operator to minimize the regional total operating cost. And the marketing clear, clearing price will uh, is deter, determined by the power dispatch model and the, the clearing price will be equal to the marginal cost of the marginal generating unit in each hour. And here is our study region and data. We use a unique data set that fighters detailed our the information on the electricity demand, the production, the interprovincial trade, as well as a consistent uh, representation of the technology stocks in China's southern five provinces, the Guangdong province, the Guangxi province, Yunnan province, Guizhou province, and the Hainan province for the year uh, 2018. And the study region, uh, account for about 19.2% of the 
uh, total Chinese population and 16.9% uh, of the national total GDP. And in 2018, electricity consumption in this region was about uh, 1,163 terawatt hour. And here is our data source. Uh, many from the hourly data is from the South China Energy Regulatory Office of the National Energy Administration. And uh, this picture give a first uh, glance of our hourly data. It shows the uh, frequency distribution of hourly electricity demand uh, alongside, alongside with the average hourly demand, the average exercise capacity. And uh, this picture is assuming that the provinces uh, supplied, uh, the provinces uh, supplied the uh, generation without, without the interprovincial trade, only by their own domestic uh, unit to meet their uh, domestic, uh, domestic uh, demand. You can see that there are uh, sizable cross provinces differences. For example, Yunnan can cover, cover its demand uh, with a uh, cheap uh, hydropower, but for Guangdong, it have the largest uh, it have the largest uh, demand among the five uh, five provinces, and it's in some hours it can't meet the, its own. Um, it's only it's capacity means that it is uh, it needs some uh, it need to import some electricity from other provinces. So based on the model and the data, we can uh, calculate the. Uh, let me move back to the uh, to this figure. We can calculate like, the generation mix, the interprovision trade, and the wholesale price. This is also our result uh, structure. First is the first is the impact on the generation mix and the supply structure. Uh, it can be found that the generation from high cost generator would be substituted by the low cost generators through market reforms. For example, the gas the gas power. The share of gas in the planning scenario is 4.6 percentage. With the market reform in the provincial markets, the share will be will reduce to 1.1 percentage. And uh, with the market integration in the uh, regional markets, the percentage, uh, the share will further reduce to the 0.05 percentage. And for hydropower, you can see that the, it will increase with the market uh, reform and with the market integration. It implies that the curtailment of the hydropower can be uh, reduced uh, by the market reform and the market uh, integration. And then is the interprovincial trade result. This map. The panel A showed the provincial market scenario. Uh, the panel A showed the interprovincial trade and the uh, each, and the generation structure of each provinces in the provincial market provincial market scenario. And the panel B is the regional market scenario. Compare the the compare these two two market scenarios, we can find that the regional market leads to an increase in the provincial electricity production, but a decrease in the trade flow among the provinces. Uh, as we assumed, the provincial the interprovincial trade in the provincial market is the same as the planning trade. So it, it means the uh, real uh, interprovincial trade is, uh, is Higher than the efficiency, uh, the higher than the efficiency levels. It may be caused by the uh, local policy and some local develop development uh, target. And for the wholesale price impact, uh, for the for the impact on the wholesale price, we can 
fun start changing from the planning scenario to a, a market scenario. It will result in a lower electricity price and a higher price risks. Uh, from planning scenario to planning scenario to provincial scenario, the average price will reduce the, by 23.5 percentage. And from planning to the uh, regional market, it will reduce the, by 22.7 percentage. Since the planning scenario uh, adopts the uh, fixed uh, benchmark uh, benchmark price, so the market reform and the market integration will uh, bring uh, will bring uh, uh, bring the market price which will uh, change by the hours. So it's uh, it's necessarily bring the bring the uh, market price risks. And uh, here is the impact on the uh, carbon emission. Uh, due to the decreasing uh, or decreasing curtailment of the hydropower and the more efficient dispatch of the coal-fired generators, the total carbon emissions will be reduced in the two market scenarios. Uh, the impact, and you can also find that the impact on emissions varies substantially across the provinces because the uh, interprovincial trade uh, uh, change and the uh, provincial generation structure is changed in the in this two market uh, ref, uh, scenario. And here is the impact on the social welfare. For the provincial market, it will uh, bring, uh, it will increase the uh, total welfare by 14.3 uh, billion yuan and the regional market will further increase it to a uh, further increase by uh, 21 billion yuan. And uh, also the market reform will bring the rent shift from the producer to consumer. And so the consumer benefit uh, from the uh, market reform. And uh, the difference in the market, uh, in the market impact is, uh, and you can find there is a difference in the market impact at the provincial level. So as the market uh, integration bring more efficient gains, but the provincial market perform, performs much better than the regional markets in terms of the equally shared the reform benefits. So at the efficient, at the efficient concern, the regional market may be better, but as the uh, equity concern, the provincial market may be uh, a bit better choice. Uh, here is the Gini value and the two market designs. And then oh, oh, it's the conclusion. Here is our findings. Replacing the governmental planning with market competition can uh, animate, uh, animate the inter-firm efficiency by reallocating the production from high-cost to uh, low-cost competitors and resulting in a price drop or reduction in emissions and generation costs, saving and welfare improvement. But market reform can have a symmetric effect at the provincial level. So the policy implication from our results, uh, from our uh, research is the different market design must be balanced against the cost of implementing. Uh, although the regional market brings greater efficient gains, they are unevenly distributed among the provinces. And for the suggestion for the market reform is uh, in the near term, the focus should be placed on creating and perfecting the provincial market well maintaining the current interprovincial trade mechanism. In the meanwhile, the provincial market design standards should be enforced in order to maintain the further uh, for future integration compatibilities. And here is our research. Thank you very much for your listening. Thank you, Jean. Very interesting. Is anyone willing to ask questions or make comments? Michael? I have a few questions. I have a few questions. Are we going to kind of have a big wrap up at the end, or do you want me to 
No, no. We'll kind of ask Jen some questions now. We will uh, we will discuss paper by paper. Okay. At the end, Great. you won't get anything. Won't get anything. Okay. Um, Jen, very interesting paper. Uh, I wanted to. Okay. Uh, uh, I guess two questions. One is on the simplifications in the planning scenario that you're assuming. So for example, um, I think the assumption in the welfare analysis is that uh, all generators face the same price, which you have listed as the average price when hydropower in general gets uh, much lower benchmark tariffs than coal plants. Uh, so that's the first one. And then the second one is if you consider some uh, security or reliability constraints. So for example, it looks like you're shutting down all of Yunnan's coal power plants. But if you talk to Yunnan power grid operators, they'll say, well, we need those coal plants for local reliability and contingency. Um, and so I'm curious uh, to what extent you've incorporated that or how you might think about that. Thanks. Uh, thank you for your question. It's a very good question. Uh, the first question is the definition of the planning scenarios. Uh, yes, the uh, benchmark price for the hydropower is lower than the benchmark price for the uh, guy uh, for the coal-fired uh, uh, for, 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 for the coal-fired coal, coal power. And uh, this planning scenario is have uh, is uh, have the province specific benchmark and the uh, interprovincial trade is also have a uh, fixed price and quantities. So it is uh, um, it is kind of very uh, highly regulated uh, scenarios for uh, for uh, to com compare with these two market scenarios. If we change the def definition of the planning scenarios, it will it won't uh influence uh our uh our basic conclusions because we compared the provincial market with the planning scenario and compared the regional market with the planning scenario so the conclusion between the uh the conclusion on the provincial market and the regional market which is better or which is much efficient is uh maybe not change much because the scenario because they compared the same scenario definitions. And the second question is also our further uh, research. Because as uh, Professor Davidson uh, concerned, the uh, energy security constraints, we didn't uh, consider it in this uh, research. And uh, like the, uh, like the, uh, like this constraints. Uh, let me move to the model. Like this generation constraints, we, the low, we only, uh, we didn't con, uh, consider it like the uh, startup cost and uh, some uh, real, reliability constraints. So it's our uh, further analysis, it's our further research directions. We also read some uh, engineering papers uh, Calcul uh, concerned this uh, security constraints. We will further include it to our models. Yeah, thank you very much. Any other uh, comment, Michael? No. Uh, Zineb, any comment? Any question? That was very interesting. Thank you. Um, I wonder uh, if it's something I, I I don't know if it's something you looked into, but just thinking about uh, kind of equity based generation uh, uh, and possibly having sort of better um, effects at the local level planning. I wonder if that might be applicable to other countries as well, if, if we could get to more kind of equitable outcomes, um, if we focus on local level rather than regional level. Um, is that something that, that you might consider or um, have looked into? Yeah, uh, good questions. And uh, it's our, uh, we only, uh, due to the data, we, uh, let me to the data constraints. Where is, uh, uh, 
this idea is uh, provided by my supervisor and uh, because we have the detailed hourly information on this, uh, on the five, pro five provincial, uh, on the China Southern Five Provincial. So we only focus on the, on these five, pro uh, on these five provinces, the, uh, the integration of these five provinces and the uh, se uh, separated of these five provinces and compare these two scenarios to, uh, to, to discuss the efficiency and the equity uh, concerns on the market reform. And uh, for the local and regional way, I think it, we, we can uh, do some, we can uh, uh, study further because the our own we only get the data for these five provinces. I'm not sure I uh, understand your uh, comments or questions, but thank you very much. Anybody else having any other question? Actually, we have a question in, in the chat. <clears throat> so ah, welcome, uh, Teotin. <laughs> Thank you. In the chat uh, of, of I have it also. We have yes. Mr. Felix uh, asking, is any of the Chinese regional wholesale power market competitive? Uh, and he's asking further, is the data for Chinese power industry publicly, uh, publicly available? Uh, the sex question, the data is, uh, is not uh, publicly available. It's we, it's uh it's from the it's from the South China Energy Regulatory Office of the National Energy Administrations. It's we uh, uh cooperation with the uh government and they provide with the uh, data and we provide some uh, advice for the government. But I think when our paper published, we can uh, share this data with other uh, uh, research researchers. And for the first question, is any of the Chinese regional wholesale power market competitive? competitive? Uh, yes, it is, it is. But in China, they are, uh, there didn't form a form a regional uh, wholesale market power. The majority um, here, the majority of Chinese provincial have achieved some progress in the establishing the wholesale market within the provinces, and the provincial market uh, didn't competitive with the with other provincial market. They only competitive with. The, gener uh, the generator only competitive within the province. Yeah. Thank you for, for the question. Anybody else willing to ask questions or to say something? So it's my turn. Jen, I have a long list of questions, but we have only three minutes left. Uh, the first is, why did you choose southern provinces? Because you are from the south or because uh, the data was available? The data is on, only available for the southern five. Uh, OK, province. I understand. I understand. Now, are these five provinces really a region? Do we have any uh, regional decision making in energy affairs? Uh, Pardon? Uh, are these five provinces acting yeah. as a single region? Do, does exist regional energy authority taking decisions? Yes, yes. The five, uh, the five provinces uh, is uh, uh, the electricity is in the uh, government by the Southern, let me do this part. Uh, move to the this. southern grid, you mean? Yeah, the southern, the south, the South China Energy Regulatory Office. He in charge of the five southern, 
Okay, I understand, yeah. I understand. Hainan is an island. Is Hainan connected to the continent with a cable? Yeah, it's con connected to the I understand. Uh, from those provinces. Yeah. Now, Thank regarding you. the data, what do you, why are you presenting the plants with their size? What is yeah. the link between the size of the plant and uh, the topic you are studying? The size of the plant. Yeah. You are presenting the plants by size. 300 megawatts, less than 300 megawatts for the smaller and 1000 or more for the bigger. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the capacity or uh, the capacity, the, cap, the, the capacity uh, is large in the Guangdong provinces. It have a, a co-fired plant with the uh, 1000 megawatt uh, plant. But for the other four uh, provinces, they only have they only have the coal, uh, they didn't have the large size coal fired plants. They only have a medium sized coal fired. Uh, okay. Coal -fired and, and you assume that the small plants are much less efficient when they burn coal? Yeah. Okay, I understand. So, Shen, I would like to congratulate you. It was a very interesting topic and uh, very well uh, presented. But uh, we now have to go to Michael. So, thanks, Jan. Michael, you have the floor and you know the rules. Congrats to Jan. Thank you very much. Michael? All right, I'm going to share my screen now. I apologize. There may be. Oh, need to uh, wait for Jen. Shen, you just need to yeah to unshare your slides to stop. So okay. thank you very much. And I apologize in advance if there's a little background noise. I'm going to do my best to talk over it. All right. Um, can you all see my shared yeah, screen? We do. Okay, great. Unfortunately, now I can't see all of your faces. So if you have questions, just sort of. Holler, don't, don't wave your hand, I won't see it. All right, so this is um, uh, joint work uh, with Valerie Karplus at Carnegie Mellon University, who's also on the call today and can field all the hard questions. Um, so we're, we're basically asking about this transition from central planning to markets. And in a central planning scenario, uh, the states own the firms, um, and decision-taking power is really moving um, from the state to potentially new firms. And there are two types of firms that we're gonna consider in the electricity sector. We have producer firms and consumer firms. Um, and in this scenario, if we move to a fully market-based system, the state's role is limited to simply designing the market rules and enforcing them. Now, in practice, in many contexts, the state continues to own, uh, maintain ownership in some firms, in particular in both the producer and the consumer sides. And then we also have an additional complication that in many countries, including China, which is the focus of our work, you have different state organizations. We have central state and local state, in particular provincial governments, which um, have shared roles in both ownership and market design rules. So this can get quite complicated in understanding uh, what is the uh, eventual um, implications on efficiency and uh, marketization in these contexts. So just a little background on the local state in China's market opening. Uh, so China in the 80s and 90s was relaxing central state planning, and this really put the local governments at the, in the driver's seat. And they were the center of a lot of new market reforms. Um, and we noticed over these several decades that growth outcomes across the provinces in China vary quite substantially due to a variety of differences in political arrangements, economic institutions, as well as the relationship between local state and, and the center. And state-owned enterprises, so this uh, creation of these new firms that the state owns, but it are not directly part of uh, central planning ministries are essential actors in this market opening strategy. And for a couple of reasons. One is that 
Um, they behave uh, differently than private firms. They have uh, uh, weak profit-oriented managerial incentives, oftentimes called soft budget constraints. And there's also a continued strong state control in energy as a strategic sector. And electricity sector reforms have really followed similar models where they've focused on creating competition, but really with limited privatization. So that is, you still have significant state ownership in the Chinese electricity sector. Uh, so marketization rates in, pro in the province after, uh, by province after the 2015 reforms, and Jen very helpfully uh, explains some of the background of those reforms, varies quite substantially. So these are, what we're looking at here is the share of electricity in these provinces that are sold through markets as opposed to through the planning mechanisms. And a few things jump out here. One is that they vary quite substantially across the country. And also the second one is that um, if you look at other market-based uh, market reform literature in China, you tend to observe that East provinces, Eastern coastal provinces move more quickly than the interior provinces in open market opening. But we don't really find that to be the case uh, if you're just looking at marketization rates across provinces. So in particular, Yunnan, Inner Mongolia, not necessarily known as market leaders, have much higher shares of marketization than their Eastern coastal uh, counterparts. Uh, so what, what we found looking at the literature is the empirical evidence, as Jen also noted, is somewhat limited on these post-2015 markets. Uh, so we have a couple of studies that have looked at different pieces of this puzzle uh, and oftentimes what you have are annual average prices being used for proxies. Um, none to our knowledge have used the sub-annual market data and the fact that these markets are cleared on a monthly or quarterly basis and firm level data to understand the causes and consequences of this provincial heterogeneity. So that brings us to our research questions. So the first one is what explains the province's different embraces of electricity markets so that marketization rate, what we're gonna be calling market extent and the second is, uh, to what extent do provinces market outcomes differ in terms of efficiency? So uh, we're going to be looking at market efficiency for these two, two different metrics. So um, to motivate our hypotheses, uh, we're going to conceptualize the market form process as fundamentally altering established institutions. And thus, market reforms will accelerate when coordination costs are low. That is, you have a small number of firms. Um, or the firms and the governments have shared interests. In particular, if the governments own the affected firms, you might see reforms accelerate because it reduces coordination costs. Um, and this sort of an alternative hypothesis would be that legatory capture would imply that well-connected firms may co-opt or delay the marketization process. Now, if we want to operationalize efficiency, we're going to be using uh, one specific metric, which is cost pass-through. And this is the extent to which changes in input prices, in particular coal, are reflected in uh, resultant market prices. And thus, we have two simultaneous factors here. One, we have the market structure. So local governments, as the driver's seats of these market design process, may alter the design or intervene uh, to favor specific firms. And then we also have different firm bidding behavior, uh, which relates to the fact that state-owned enterprises may have these soft budget constraints and respond differently to cost pass uh, to changes in price inputs compared to private firms. And so this gets us to our main hypotheses here. And what I'm showing is on the, on the top, we have electricity producer local ownership and electricity consumer local ownership. And you can see we have high and low, so the idea being that if you have high local ownership in the producers and high local ownership in the consumers, uh, we would expect the coordination to be coordination costs to be lower and to see a higher marketization rate. On the other end of the spectrum, if local ownership is low and uh, consumer on uh, both the consumer and the producer side, we might expect to have low marketization rates because the coordination costs and the alignment between government and firms um, is weaker. And we have two cases, uh, Shandong and Guangdong, which I've uh, noted here, kind of exist in these two corner cases where we might expect to have moderate marketization rates, and we would also expect to see different levels of cost pass through because of the, uh, the, the interests of the local government and either the producer or the consuming side of the equation. So the data for this are uh, marketization rates are taken the quarterly level from China Electricity Council. Uh, our monthly data, prices and quantities 
are taken from a variety of sources. In particular, the electricity market outcomes are taken from provincial exchange center announcements um, posted on their website. And then we also use some pre-reform ownership covariates uh, based on a couple of other data sets. So first, the market extent. Uh, so we're looking at the, trying to predict the marketization rate by province. So that um, map I showed you at the beginning over time. And we're looking at the contribution of the ownership shares at the uh, provincial or lower level in the manufacturing sector as an example of a consuming industry that is a large electricity uh, consumer. And then we're also looking at the shares of coal generators that are not uh, owned by the central state. And so that would be province or uh, lower or private firms. And what we find is that local ownership on both the producer and the consumer sides tend to increase marketization in line with our hypothesis that we're reducing coordination costs and creating more alignment between the decision makers, the government, and the affected entities. Sorry. Um, uh, and so we find this um, to be uh, statistically significant. And then looking at the market efficiency side of the equation, uh, we're going to uh, first look at coal price pass through at a provincial level. Uh, so we're just looking at the provincial cleared um, auction prices and these coal price benchmarks that vary by month in the province. And we particularly find this interesting relationship where uh, Shandong uh, really behaves as we might expect. That is, as the coal price increases, electricity prices increase. Um, so we see some cross pass through. Guangdong, we see this very curious negative relationship, um, which could indicate uh, uh, a variety of um, uh, potential uh, reform uh, market design issues or firm bidding behavior issues that are affecting the, um, the efficiency of this market. Uh, the, uh, then the, the final analysis we're doing here is looking at firm level data. And what we have, we have observations of quantities of the final cleared amount by firm in, in these provinces. And so we're gonna see, do these quantities uh, relate to coal prices? So are they, are they looking, are they, um, are they uh, effectively passing through changes in input prices? And is that somehow, if we interact that with the oversight level of these firms, i.e. central, state-owned, provincial state-owned or private, does that affect their responsiveness to coal prices? So uh, here are the results. And for each of these, we have um, an oversight category and the central SOE is the reference category. Um, I just wanna draw your attention to these results here, the interaction terms, where we find that Shandong, we don't seem to find any statistically significant differences among the different oversight levels and their response to coal prices. That is, uh, private firms, provincial firms, central firms, all seem to respond similarly to changes in coal prices. On the other hand, Guangdong shows a very clear uh, difference in uh, the response to coal prices relative to the central state-owned enterprise, which could indicate uh, that you have market design issues that are differentiating based on ownership and or possibly firm bidding behavior is different among these entities. Um, so to um, uh, sort of wrap up some of the discussion here, uh, first is we find that central government uh, appears to support power sector reforms to realize efficiencies as we'd expect. Um, and central SOEs appear to be less exposed financially to the market reforms. That is, they're responding uh, some, at a uh, somewhat less to coal price pass-through concerns, uh, thus demonstrating that they're somewhat more robust to the financial implications of market reforms. And we also found that provincial government interests can influence the pace of the bottom-up market process. In particular, we showed that there's strong local ownership among consumers uh, and producers may propel these market reforms forward uh, and in terms of market extent, as well as possibly efficiency. And then kind of a, a broader takeaway here is if the reforms are aimed to encourage utilization of larger, more efficient generators, 
uh, then central architects might want to consider whether they'd be willing to share the spoils. So this relates to this equity or distributional benefits that Jim and others talked about, um, or at least keep the local governments whole. So if local generators uh, stand to lose in this new market reform process um, to their central SOE counterparts, um, then there might be a need for, a, uh, for other kinds of uh, transfers to keep the provincial uh, governments whole so that they can uh, continue to engage in the market reform process. Um, so um, that was, I went through those slides fairly quickly because um, I'm really looking forward to discussion and I can go back to any if folks want to discuss any of the numbers in detail. Another very interesting research. Of course, I will give the first uh, floor to Jen. Jen, would you, would you like to react to ask questions yeah, or yeah. comments? Uh, very interesting pre presentation. Thank you, uh, Professor Davidson. Uh, I have a question on the uh, on the uh, bidding data. Is the data uh, as as uh, I know that the pro, uh, the Guangdong province and the Shandong province um, uh, do some uh, 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 market test uh, in uh, July or August twenty. Uh, do some the marginal running tests uh, in the 20, 20 year, right? So the data is the from the bidding data is the from the is uh from the uh uh, uh from the uh, from the market uh running test, right? That that's the data from the market running test in uh July and August. So here is the data slide. Uh, um, okay. So the, the the market running test that I that you're referring to, I think, is the is the spot market. Um, and so there's there's simulate there's uh, test runs of a pilot spot market that have been going on in Guangdong for about a year uh, with varying degrees of participation, but overall very small portion of the market. We're not looking at the spot market here. Um, we're looking okay. at the provincial uh, provincial monthly markets. And so and, uh, the vast, major vast majority of electricity that is sold through markets in China currently is sold through these monthly um, or quarterly auctions depending on the province. So that's what we're looking at here. Okay, and I have a uh, information on the, I have a background information on the Guangdong province market running test maybe will maybe will help you work uh, work with your research. It's that the uh, state owned and the local owned uh, plant before the market running test, they try to uh, collusion to try to collusion to beat their quantities when the market running test, but the collusion is only work for about one day or two days because other competitors try to uh, uh, bid for their uh, bid for the for, for their best response uh, quantities. So it maybe uh, help you to uh, make the regression on the auction part uh, a better con consider is this strategy bidding behaviors between these state owned uh, firms. Yeah. Thanks, really fascinating. It's really hard to get data on uh, collusive activities in electricity markets. So I have many um, anecdotal evidence that it, that it happens. So yeah, any, any information you have on that would be great. Jen, any other comment, any other question? You are mute. I have no questions. Thanks very much for the presentation. Okay. Zineb, anything to ask or anything to comment? Um, yeah, 
again, really interesting presentation. Um, it's not really, I guess it's more of a comment than a, a question at this point. Uh, it's in, it just kind of crossed my mind, interesting maybe to consider if, again, the effect of uh, the kind of hypothesis you posit about marketization, if they'd be value, valued in other countries, uh, not necessarily um, kind of all around the world, but other, other countries which are also transitioning from centralized um, uh, regimes to uh, more kind of um, open systems. Um, but uh, yeah, very interesting, as, as I say, it's not really a question, more of a comment, and I think it could be relevant to other regions as well. Yeah, thanks. I think if you if you have this combination of uh, central ownership and local ownership uh, in a kind of a larger, more federated country, then yeah, you might might expect to see some similar um, trends. Uh, we do what we find is that if you're looking at sort of smaller cases where you have, for example, a large state-owned utility, um, it's usually nationally owned. And so this kind of variation we're looking at here doesn't really exist. Um, but it would be interesting to look at, um, for example, Russia has some very interesting power sector reform periods that related to state, own, uh, state ownership and central state relations. Another interesting context could be the European Union. I don't know. Um, there's I mean, that's not something we've explored here, um, but historically thinking, thinking more about how national governments interact with um, efforts to build cross-border electricity systems and exchange mechanisms. Anybody else? This time we have the chat being opened, so we do not have anything new from the chat. So Michael, could you explain me again why provincial, ah, Felix is asking, well, I will, I will take Felix in a minute. Could you explain me again why provincial players should play marketization? Why they shouldn't play local politics? And local politics could be to protect coal miners, existing coal plants, etc., which is not necessarily leading to marketization. Yeah, that's a very good question. I set that up as uh, we, we set that up as an alternative hypothesis, where, uh, for example, local firms. I guess in a narrow sense, you could say that they capture their government regulators, or in a broader sense, if they are the government, then they may have different um, different objectives. So we said that as an alternative hypothesis, uh, and um, but the the kind of the primary hypothesis here, which would um, lean towards uh, local governments or lo localities that have more ownership. Uh, moving more quickly in market reforms is basically around the idea uh, that uh, the market reform process is happening. Local governments can take control and use the market design to their advantage if they can get sufficient buy-in and uh, control over the reform process. And so we find if you just like, look at the market designs across provinces, you see all sorts of different treatments, um, for example, based on consuming industries, you have all sorts of price caps and price limitations and quantity limitations, et cetera, indicating provincial governments can use these various levers to affect their other policy goals. And so if you have lower coordination costs uh, because the players are smaller, you might see that process taking place in an easier way. The central government to their on their side has indicated that all provinces need to move towards 100% marketization. Um, so there is that kind of long-term goal that they're not gonna be able to avoid creating market designs, but the, I thought the, sort of the primary hypothesis here is that coordination costs lower. Um, uh, but I, think, I do think that that's a really interesting uh, sort of conundrum based on conventional wisdom that they, would, they might try to co-opt or delay the reform process. I don't know if Valerie, had, you have some other thoughts on that. Valerie? 
Sure, yeah. And I think what's really interesting here is actually, uh, uh, you know, the ability to look at, at cost pass through as a way of measuring uh, which constituency essentially the province, the provincial government is, is favoring through the all the other um, uh, hurdles, institutions, variables that are included um, in uh, that that can in, that can interfere with, say, central efforts to to advance market reform. So I think we do need to be more granular about what it is at the level of the provincial government. What levers can they pull? How what ways can they sort of, um, uh, direct or possibly slow down or actually favor specific constituencies? I think in the reason why we compare Shandong and Guangdong is because uh, we have a variation in whether it's the producers or the consumers of power that are really, I think, uh, are, are um, sort of more closely uh, tied to the the provincial government through ownership ties. So okay. um, I, I think we, you, you were trying to exploit that variation. We would love to have data on more provinces because I think as you could see from the regressions, numbers are still small, but we, but, but really um, the idea is that in provinces where you have, where you might favor, you might have a stronger uh, influence coming from the consumers, the large industrials, then you would see you would see alignment with the central agenda of advancing reform and uh, increasing cost pass through and realizing economic efficiency. In cases where you have a strong uh, provincial presence of the power sector and an influence from the local power generators, especially those that um, you, know, you have a lot of small private uh, generators in some provinces that are very keen to protect their interests through ties with the local government. This isn't something we can easily flesh out, and but um, we're we are working on trying to find evidence of how they can influence uh, the local mm -hmm. implementation of the reform process. Okay, so you are studying the political economy. Yes, yes, exactly. Okay. Very brave and because uh, that's one of my dreams. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because. We need yeah, to talk because, more. <laughs> but because China is a different type of country. So we cannot assume that we know. And even we cannot assume that we spontaneously understand because it's a different country on, in, in, in any meaning. So it's and very I think, interesting. And I think you're, you're bringing, this is raising a broader, I think a really important point, which is that in China, there are many uh, concepts that are essentially localized. Uh, you know, you've heard capitalism with Chinese characteristics. Well, if you think about sort of market reform, electricity market reform could be proceeding quite differently, but we believe that the underlying sort of political economy drivers are still worth testing and exploring and understanding. Yeah, so that's what uh, where we're starting. And then um, what we're, you know, willing to, to, uh, we're open to alternate implementations of some of these classical concepts. My, my own daughter lived in China for 20 years, Hong Kong and Beijing. And she is unable to explain me how it works. She is able to tell me what her friends think, but they do not know how it works, which is very, it's, it's a different type of country, and it's very fascinating to understand. OK, so the question from Felix were, what is the prospect of power market deregulation? I assume it means power market opening in China. So I assume in China in general. So you have to differentiate between provinces or regions. Who is willing to answer, Jeanne or uh, Michael? Jen, go ahead. Uh, um, I, I know some the recent collusion cases in the uh, power sector, but it's only occur in the uh, market running test. And uh, it's very uh, interesting in the Guangdong provinces. They are the, uh, the two, I, 
and now to the local the uh, province province uh, the local government own the uh, plan plan uh, plans try to uh, try to collude uh, try to uh, make uh, make a collusion uh, make a collude the uh, uh, bid in the market running tests and uh, the interesting is that they uh, they try to uh, bid uh, uh, lower quantities in the first uh, two uh, first uh, two days of the running market running uh, tests, but uh, but the collusion is not last for the entire running uh, run, 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 running period because the reason is that they didn't consider it the uh, a private owned uh, uh, a private owned uh, co-fired uh, plant. So in the first day, they bid a little quantity, and the private uh, plant bid 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 its all capacity. So they the private owned plant enjoyed the uh, price due to the uh, uh, lower bid of the two state owned plants. So the second day, the one of the state-owned plants find the private uh, plant uh, earn more in the yesterday's uh, bidding auction. So they try to bid bid uh, uh, its all uh, all capacity in the uh, market. So it's uh, it's the uh, a failed collusion case in the running uh, in the Guangdong market running tests. So it's very interesting, and uh, we, uh, uh, and uh, one of my uh, co-author, the professor Zhu Gaojiang, he is a, uh, 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 he is, uh, uh, he is very, uh, he is, he know a lot of the uh, uh, case in the Guangdong. So if you are interested, you can send an email to us. We will, we can discuss this case uh, further. Yeah. Many many thanks, John. Very. Very, very gentle from you. Michael, anything to say or to add? Uh, well, I think it's a, it's a very broad question, you know, what's the direction of the market reform process? Um, there've been a couple uh, with several papers um, on this question. Um, I have two of them just last year and there are many others out there uh, because it's a very complicated process, uh, you know, shifting the largest power sector in the world from central planning to markets where every province has its own decision makers and unique political economy factors. And so I think the direction is still uncertain. And I think on top of all of this, and we now have um, some fairly high profile carbon targets, which are going to have, I think, a, a pretty um, immediate long-term impact on uh, the market designs that are going to be accepted, acceptable going forward. So I think it's an interesting space to watch. Thank you. Valerie, something to add on this topic? Uh, no, I think that those papers are excellent references, though. So um, not at the moment. Thank you. Okay. And uh, May we see, uh, I, will, I will ask another question. What are the key central entities acting in the power sector? Because the energy policy or even the power policy is not unified at the central sector. We have different administrations intervening. So how do you conceive the, or do you know or do you define the respective roles of the different central administrations concerning the energy sector, the power sector? Jen, Michael? So I think we're not, we're not getting at that uh, level of granularity in this analysis because we wouldn't be able to really distinguish uh, among the various roles, but um, roughly speaking at the provincial level, um, you have uh, two main um, agencies that are involved. One's called the Economic Information Commission. The other one is the Development Reform Commission. They have different uh, 
uh, different authorities in designing markets and planning the, the electricity process. And then you also have the National Energy Administration, which has regional and provincial subsidiary branches, which is sort of a market supervisor and um, an approver of plans. But they tend to have a more weak regulated role compared to independent regulators in other contexts. And so what we're, you know, what we're assuming here is that provincial governments have enormous amount of autonomy in how they design markets with relatively little central oversight. Uh, so for example, if the central government had more oversight, they might uh, use a regulator to intervene to protect central state-owned enterprises. So we're assuming that, in fact, the provincial governments have a large amount of autonomy, which is actually supported by a lot of evidence, both quantitative and interview-based, um, but that is the assumption. At the central level, there are, of course, different different interests, bureaucratic interests in pushing forward market reforms, generally the planning ministry uh, and the, the sort of the central uh, level ministry of industry and um, industry information technology is gonna try to oppose market opening because they were the planners and they tend to lose out in that. Um, and then the folks that are designing the markets want to promote market planning. And then I think the environment and climate ministries are uh, generally want more markets because they see that as necessary to, to increase efficiency of the power sector, but also want to have lots of different planning and requirements on promoting renewables. And so I think there's it's, it's complicated at both the central and the local level, which we're not getting into at that granular level in this analysis. Thank you, Michael. And again, congratulations for your excellent research. Now we are going to ZNEP. ZNEP. The floor is yours. You, you are going to touch democracy and electricity. Which way? You are the only one to know, but soon all of us will know. And hopefully you can see my slides. Okay, uh, yes. Uh, so uh, I'm going to be talking about the um, relationship between democracy and energy source deployment and uh, kind of potential role for um, industry to, to um, uh, moderate the, the uh, influence of democracy on, on energy preferences. So I'll be presenting work that I've been collaborating on um, together with David Reiner, who's also based in the Energy Policy Research Group in Cambridge. Um, my presentation will uh, consist of five main parts, so I'll briefly summarise the context of our work and then I'll talk a little bit, a bit about our theoretical approach. Um, I'll also outline the kind of main aspects of our research design and then most of the presentation will be about our main results and, and um, uh, kind of key findings and then I'll, I'll finish by reflecting on some conclusions. Uh, so uh, the context of our work is uh, the kind of growing number of countries that are adopting decarbonisation and net zero targets and the kind of drive to um, uh, reach an ambitious temperature target and, and uh, in the context of the Paris Agreement. Uh, and um, it, it's especially evident that, that the power sector and uh, decarbonising um, energy generation is, is going to be a, a key role in a global mitigation efforts. So electricity generation and consumption account for around three quarters of global greenhouse gases and um, energy transition uh, is estimated to be able to provide about 39% of, of the necessary um, uh, mitigation from energy. So uh, decarbonising energy is, is uh, really important. Um, yet, yeah, despite the kind of rationale uh, for this, um, uh, energy transition in the power sector has been quite slow, um, especially in some countries and regions. And so this is the kind of puzzle that we were interested in exploring. And um, coming from a political science background, um, we wanted to look at the role of, of um, uh, political factors in, in kind of piecing um, together parts of the puzzle. Uh, so our theoretical approach is um, uh, based on uh, uh, quite a rich literature which uh, argues that democracies are better than non-democracies at environmental provision. Um, and this has been documented in um, a, a wide range of empirical areas such as um, air pollution, um, water quality, um, control and, and um, climate mitigation increasingly. Uh, and drawing on this literature, um, a number of scholars argue that democracies are um, therefore more accommodating to um, energy transition and to uh, deploying um, low carbon energy sources. 
uh, although uh, the um, uh, empirical track record for this is quite mixed. Um, so um, on the one hand, there are um, lots of examples of, of democracies which might be pioneering the way to um, decarbonizing their energy sectors. And maybe we think of uh, the EU especially. Um, uh, but on the other hand, there are, there are other democracies which are, are clearly much more um, reticent uh, to undermining the traditional role of, of fossil fuels in, in energy. Um, so we were interested in um, uh, trying to identify kind of um, uh, uh, pathways through which um, this distinction between democracies and non-democracy um, might translate into um, energy deployment practices um, across a range of different um, energy sources. So um, uh, based on the literature, we identified about uh, five um, different kind of key attributes um, or aspects of democracy, uh, which we expect to play an important role. But in this presentation, I'll just be focusing on one. Um, which is the opportunity for civil society to influence energy decision making. Um, and uh, in democracies, um, we might expect that increased opportunity for civil society to um, influence policymakers in deciding which energy sources to deploy um, might uh, give more opportunity for environmental interests, say, to um, impose um, more pressure for um, uh, transitioning to low carbon energy sources. But then on the other hand, uh, could also um, uh, give kind of more opportunity for um, fossil fuel industries to resist those kinds of changes and, and to um, uh, support continued use of fossil energies. Um, whereas if we look at the right hand column in um, more closed political regimes, we might expect that um, autocratic rulers would kind of be able to steer deployment decisions more efficiently because they don't necessarily need to balance these um, competing interests. Uh, so um, really our, our kind of hypothesis relating to um, this particular aspect of democracy is, is open-ended. Um, so we um, uh, came up with uh, two um, kind of um, competing um, expectations about this democracy um, uh, effect on uh, energy source deployment. So uh, the blue line is obviously the positive relationship. So marginal deployment of energy sources um, uh, increases, the level of democracy increases. And then we also um, left way for uh, the um, opposite relationship. So we'd expect um, democracy to inhibit um, deployment of, uh, of energy sources. Uh, and uh, the second kind of uh, leg of our theoretical approach is based on interest uh, group politics, um, uh, which um, uh, uh, tells us that policy outcomes reflect the kind of competing interests of, of um, uh, key actors, um, so groups uh, who stand to be most affected by um, uh, policy outcomes. Um, and um, a small but growing number of uh, scholars argue that this is the case of energy policy. So um, practices uh, in terms of um, which energy sources are deployed uh, and uh, to which level um, reflect the kind of competing interests of um, uh, of actors uh, in, in the energy sector. And so there are lots of actors um, that one might focus on or might conceptualize as an interest group. Uh, and uh, we looked at industry um, uh, uh, for various reasons, but I'll just kind of highlight two. Um, one is that industry accounts for around 54% of energy consumption worldwide. Um, so presumably they'd have um, a, a lot of um, stakes and a lot of um, kind of influence over um, uh, uh, policy making in this field. Uh, and indeed, industry, uh, energy security is often operationalized as industrial energy intensity. So there's uh, clearly a kind of um, a strong relationship there between um, industrial energy interests um, so uh, what might industrial interest towards energy be? Um, well, on first uh, glance, we might think that, um, and, uh, that industry would be kind of biased towards fossil fuels because these have traditionally been used and uh, are more kind of entrenched in the system. Um, uh, there are also reliability concerns over um, uh, uh, electricity generation from renewables. Uh, uh, but then on the other hand, um, it's possible to integrate renewables in centralized systems and indeed diversified um, or hybrid energy systems uh, uh, can also increase uh, security. So in this way, kind of alleviate um, reliability concerns, which might um, inhibit support for low carbon options. Uh, another kind of reason for expecting a fossil fuel bias might be that fossil fuels, at least in the short run, uh, might be cheaper. Uh, but then there's again, counter arguments we made that governments could intervene um, uh, by setting um, uh, prices or um, subsidizing uh, certain, um, or say, low carbon energy options. Um, or mandating um, other options. Um, uh, so they could uh, reduce the prices and, and, and make other sources kind of more competitive. 
uh, and also um, increasing uh, dependence on renewables would reduce sensitivity to fossil fuel prices in the world market. So again, uh, there might be reasons for expecting that um, industry would have um, interests in um, uh, transitioning to other energy sources as well as fossil fuels. So overall, we expect that uh, industry, because they uh, because it's interested in um, having a reliable and uh, cheap uh, electricity supply, would uh, kind of be um, in favour of increasing um, uh, energy uh, deployment. This is a kind of very broad kind of claim, and um, to uh, uh, to give you a kind of visual illustration of this. Uh, so just uh, building on the previous hypothesis, that, so we have our, our uh, kind of parallel competing um, uh, potential relationships between democracy and energy deployment. Um, uh, and the thin lines represent um, uh, uh, when industry uh, is uh, weak or a, a kind of a smaller consumer in the uh, of uh, national um, electricity. Um, uh, and then the thick lines represent a kind of stronger industrial presence. So uh, we expect if um, there is a positive relationship between democracy and energy deployment, uh, as, as shown by the blue, then um, in the presence of a, a strong industrial lobby, uh, then we'd expect the relationship to be even stronger or steeper. And um, uh, in the opposite scenario, so if there's a negative democracy relationship, we expect a strong industrial presence would make that negative um, relationship kind of less negative or counteract it. Um, so uh, we uh, suggest our second hypothesis as industrial representation in a country increases, the effect of democracy on marginal deployment of energy sources also um, increases. Uh, so now I'm going to move on to um, our research design. Uh, we uh, uh, put together a data set consisting of 136 countries, um, which span 19 regions, um, as defined by the Carbon Briefs um, Climate Negotiating Alliances. And our time period is 1990 till 2018, so we have just under 4,000 observations. Um, we look at a range of energy sources, uh, so um, including fossil fuels um, and also some um, low carbon um, energy sources. Uh, our um, a kind of model design is, is a hierarchical model, which consists of three levels. Uh, so we have country years, which are um, nested in countries, uh, uh, which are further nested in supranational uh, regions. Um, and the kind of rationale for having this um, uh, three level approach uh, is uh, sort of summarized in this table, um, uh, which shows the results of, of a series of null models. So they are just empty models, which consist of uh, the three levels I had mentioned. Um, and they disaggregate the, um, the variation in the uh, energy source uh, deployment data for each energy. Um, and uh, you can see the significant entries are telling us that um, the deployment of each energy source is significantly clustered at, at, across all three levels of the model. Um, the only exception to this is ge geothermal, um, for which regional um, uh, variation is not significant. But um, for all the others, um, the three levels are, are important uh, to include there. Um, so it, basically means that uh, uh, observations of energy um, uh, deployment from uh, uh, that are taken from the same country and from the same region are more likely to be similar to each other than observations of deployment uh, which are taken from other countries or other regions. Um, and uh, the um, uh, variance partition um, coefficients which are shown in brackets, they uh, show the kind of um, rounded percentage um, uh, level, share of um, variation in the, in the deployment data across the levels of the model. So um, you can see in particular, the country level is, is quite important. And for most of the energy sources, uh, most variation in deployment is, is concentrated at the country level. Uh, so these are, uh, this is a kind of summary of our coding strategy and the main variables that we, uh, or the, all the variables rather, that we included. So our dependent variable is log annual marginal change in electricity generation uh, from each energy source. And uh, we um, refer to the uh, uh, IEA's uh, World Extended Energy Balances and Summary Report from last year for this data. Um, for democracy, we referred to uh, a, a three different um, democracy databases, which are, are used um, uh, quite frequently in, in um, the democracy um, research in, in the political science field. Um, so we worked mainly with the VDEM data uh, and also with the Freedom House data. And this is an index value which um, ranges from zero, so um, very undemocratic to one, uh, very democratic. And uh, for industry, uh, we uh, use the uh, share of industrial to total electricity consumption in a, in a given country year again from the IEA data. 
And we also included a series of control variables. So we had um, a lagged electricity generated from that energy source um, a, a, a number of significant um, years ago. We did some preliminary tests to identify which um, time lag was significant for each um, energy source. And then um, other controls, total energy consumption, population growth, um, GDP, and um, the share of natural resource rents um, of total GDP as well. Um, so this is our uh, core model, um, which includes the interaction terms that we're interested in. Um, I won't dwell on this too much, but I think the um, kind of important ones are that so beta eight, the industry and democracy interaction, which I was referring to earlier, um, and then um, a beta 11, which is uh, an interaction, a uh, kind of cross interaction, uh, also uh, involving um, a lag deployment of that energy source um, to uh, allow for kind of uh, cross uh, spillover effects from previous years on the interaction. So this is a, a summary of our results. And I'll start by focusing on uh, the first hypothesis. Um, so the effect of democracy on uh, energy deployment. Um, our first model is important for, the, for answering this hypothesis. So I'll shade out the second model. Um, so for each energy source, the, um, the first model is kind of a, a, a a reference point which doesn't include any of the interaction terms so it just tells us the uh, pure effects if you like of, of democracy and industry and the other controls on um, energy deployment and um, uh, you can if we look at the first row the fixed effects um, uh, under the fixed effects heading so democracy doesn't have any significant effect a uh, significant um, fixed effect on um, energy deployment for, for any energy source apart from nuclear um, uh, nuclear um, uh, the nuclear um, coefficient tells us that if we increase, uh, so if we move from a, a closed regime to a, a, a very democratic regime, then we see an increase of 0 0.52 um, uh, gigawatt hours in um, a deployment of nuclear um, energy for electricity generation. Um, but this is only significant for nuclear. Uh, but uh, this is not to mean that democracy doesn't have a significant effect on um, the deployment of the other sources. So if we look at the random effects um, coefficients, uh, you can see that they're all highly significant. And um, uh, our model allowed for the um, effect of democracy to vary uh, between different countries. And these significant readings uh, tell us that um, uh, uh, democracy does have a significant effect on, on energy deployment uh, and that this effect um, uh, it differs uh, 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 to an important extent between different countries. So we really need to look at, at each um, uh, uh, at each uh, relationship on a kind of case by case or country by country uh, basis. Um, so to um, give you a little bit more of a, an understanding of, of um, what these random effects are modeling. Um, so this is a, a, a graphic representation of the um, country level effects uh, for coal generation. Um, so each uh, dot is uh, uh, the kind of marginal effect of um, going from a closed to a very open regime on uh, coal energy deployment. And uh, you can see the, the dots or the countries which are located above the y-axis, um, they, uh, they, are, um, they have, are associated with positive democracy relationships. Um, so democracy has, a, a, has the effect of increasing coal energy deployment, whereas countries that fall below the y-axis um, have the opposite um, a relationship. So a democracy is associated with um, inhibiting coal energy deployment. And, and the dashed line there, which is at about 0 0.38, um, that's the fixed um, uh, estimate for the um, democracy effect on coal, uh, and uh, clearly that's a poor estimate um, of the effect of democracy across all countries because they're, they're distributed so widely. Um, so it kind of shows the merit of using uh, of allowing um, uh, democracy effects to vary between countries. Um, and now moving on to a second hypothesis about the potential role for industry to uh, moderate the effect of democracy on energy deployment. So uh, this time we're looking at the second models, um, which uh, includes the full set of interaction terms. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're interested in two particular interactions, um, so which involve democracy and industry uh, directly. Um, so I'll just shade in yellow the uh, significant terms there. Uh, and you can see for for a coal, nuclear, geothermal, and solar and wind, um, uh, uh, industry plays a significant role in um, moderating the effect of democracy on the deployment of these energy sources for electricity generation. Uh, but we don't find any significant moderating effects uh, for oil, gas, or um, hydro uh, energy. Uh, we can't really infer too much 
uh, about the nature of these interaction effects um, uh, or the directions of these effects from these results. Uh, so uh, we uh, tried um, uh, kind of modeling uh, or predicting um, uh, uh, marginal effects under um, different conditions of um, industrial strength or industrial um, consumption. Uh, and um, uh, so if, if we start with the mean or sort of average, um, a pooled average value of industrial um, energy consumption uh, as a share of total energy consumption, um, uh, you can see that the um, coefficients, uh, uh, so the marginal effect of democracy is always negative uh, across all of these um, energy sources. Uh, so in general, um, and, uh, um, democracy has a negative effect on the deployment of these energy sources. But if we move to a higher level of industry, um, so uh, say the mean plus one standard deviation, uh, then we see that uh, again most of these coefficients are negative, um, uh, but they are the magnitudes of these relationships um, uh, decrease. So um, they are negative, but less negative. Um, or in the case of oil, um, we actually switch from a positive, from a negative to a positive democracy um, relationship. So clearly, industry is kind of playing a, a role in counteracting that negative or inhibitory effect of democracy on, on um, energy deployment. And to um, hopefully uh, give a clearer illustration of this, um, if we, we can look at some graphs of the um, relationships uh, uh, shown by the um, interaction effects uh, for the energy sources, which, uh, which we're shown to have um, uh, significant interaction terms. And so we have our kind of theoretical um, uh, uh, model for, um, graph on the left there. And we can see that the, the so the thin lines represent uh, low levels of um, industrial um, strength and uh, the thick lines high levels of industrial energy consumption. Uh, and we can see when energy consumption in, uh, when industry grows stronger uh, than the inhibitory um, a re relationship between uh, democracy and coal energy deployment um, is still inhibitory, but it becomes um, less negative. So the, the line is flatter. And we see this for all of the energy um, uh, sources that we looked at. Uh, so again, for nuclear, geothermal, um, uh, solar and wind, although um, less um, pronounced than the other energy sources. And I'll finish by reflecting on some conclusions then. Uh, so our first hypothesis related to the effect of democracy on energy deployment um, uh, uh, across a number of uh, different sources. Uh, and uh, we found that for all sources, uh, if it's uh, to the extent that it's possible to generalize, uh, and democracy tends to have an inhibitory effect on uh, the deployment of, of um, low carbon and uh, fossil fuel energy sources. And uh, for theoretical reasons, we expect that there might be differences between centralized uh, um, energy um, technologies, such as building a nuclear plant or a coal plant, and decentralized um, options, such as a, a local level um, a solar and wind energy. But we didn't find any um, evidence of, of differences for these either. Um, our second hypothesis was about the role of industry in moderating the effect of democracy. Um, uh, and so we found that um, for a number of technologies, industrial strength um, inhibits the negative um, democracy effect on um, energy deployment. And then we also did some robustness checks using um, other uh, measures of uh, democracy. Um, uh, so I presented the, the Freedom House data here, but we also use the VDEM. And also we uh, uh, use some kind of sub indices which focus on specific aspects of democracy to see which, which um, dimensions might be uh, kind of driving this relationship. Um, which I didn't have time to, to go into. Uh, uh, in terms of, of the generalizability of our findings, and um, so uh, we think that, so we found evidence that uh, there are significant democracy effects um, uh, for all energy sources across, um, uh, 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 and that these effects vary significantly um, between different countries. And so they're worth looking um, uh, at in, in further detail on a country by country basis. And uh, the interaction effect um, with, with um, industry and democracy was significant for coal, nuclear, geothermal, solar and wind energy deployment. Uh, and uh, yes, just underlying again the, the kind of importance of, of um, looking at that uh, at a, a specific country to uh, uh, determine the effects that, that democracy might have um, uh, and, and empirically, um, uh, 
the, the kind of key implication here is that the change in democracy, um, uh, so say uh, uh, democratization or so reforms in this manner, uh, are likely to have different effects depending on uh, the uh, level of industrial representation uh, within that country. So it would be wrong to expect that uh, a kind of uh, similar changes in uh, political um, regimes would, would give rise to similar, um, uh, similar changes in terms of energy deployment um, across countries. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Zineb. Very puzzling. <laughs> I like challenges, but I am challenged. Huh? Uh, but I do not have to speak first. Michael, Jeanne, are you willing to ask questions or to make comments? Uh, I have a little question. It's a very Please? interesting uh, topic about how the, the uh, domestic uh, affects the, the energy deployment, and uh, you examine the uh, domestic in, in uh, uh, affects the energy deployment through the industrial representation. Uh, and my question is that is there uh, besides the industrial representation, is there any other uh, mechanism for the democracy to influence the energy uh, deployment? Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I'm sure there are lots of other things that, that we could look into, especially um, considering that industry was just one example of an interest group for us. So there will be lots of other um, important um, uh, interest groups in the energy sector, um, which, uh, which we could and I think should look at, um, even maybe just disaggregating industry into um, different kinds of industrial actors. Um, so, for example, energy industry um, uh, and uh, the um, uh, greenhouse gas removal industry, um, they would have very uh, different and maybe competing um, interests. So, yeah, I think there, there are definitely other actors and um, uh, other kind of variables that might be moderating the democracy effect and probably worth looking at more. Thank you, Zineb. Michael, anything to ask, to tell? Sure. This, uh, this is a really fascinating study. Um, and I had just so many things came to mind as I was listening to this. Um, uh, first off, I, I did appreciate the uh, Buena de Mesquita kind of uh, selectorate winning coalition concept. And you can put it in perhaps a spectrum to with the democracy in order to maybe piece apart a little bit what is the mechanism through which representation in industry or other stakeholders uh, will influence um, energy sector decisions. So in particular, the sort of the fundamental assumption there is that uh, the winning coalition of autocrats is very small, so they can buy them off and they don't have to engage in as much representation with the rest of the populace, whereas in democracy, your winning coalition is very, very large. And so in that sense, if your winning coalition includes industry groups, then of course you have to go in, you have to buy them off, you have to provide all sorts of rents for them. If your winning coalition doesn't include industry, then it flips the other direction and you probably will have uh, a lower uh, preference to provide those goods for the industrial sector compared to say a democracy. And so it's interesting to think about, you know, who might be in that winning coalition in these various countries. And, a, and part of that might be uh, the variance at a subnational level of uh, incumbent industries or fossil fuel resources. So for example, there was a report recently which uh, showed that I think uh, most OECD countries have at least one region that's greater than 50% dependent on coal. It's not that at a national level, it's lower than that, but if you have some or multiple regions in a democratic context, they can perhaps um, as virtue of this winning coalition argument, they might be very important actors in, in democratic governance um, and, and you know, incorporate, for example, veto points, et cetera. We see this in the US as one example, as I'm thinking about, um, because all energy policy in the US is basically what West Virginia wants right now. That's a very a narrow interpretation, but um, you know, that could occur in different democratic contexts. So if you like, think about it, like that mechanism, because when I first saw this, I wasn't quite sure you know, why would just a generic industry affect the preference as an industry, you know, overall consuming side, why would this affect 
uh, supply decisions, right? That that was a little, uh, I did, uh, you know, that mechanism wasn't quite there for me. And I'm thinking, um, you know, maybe there are some other components of the structure of the coalitions and the vari variants. Uh, and perhaps even you can get into, since these are democracies, you have parties, you have who's in power, and you can you can get into a lot more granular level than than these kind of um, single national year observations. So I'll stop there. But I have a lot of other thoughts. I think it's really interesting. Thank you, David. Uh, that, uh, sorry, Michael. That that's uh, uh, lots of great suggestions. I've taken down lots of notes, so you've given me a lot to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else willing to ask questions to say something? So it seems that it might um, have a very long list, um, but maybe I will start by the most basic one. Maybe because I am older than you, I wonder what you call democracy. It's, for me, it's the word democracy is a mystery. So could you use other words to tell me what is democracy in this research? Yeah, um, really important um, point. And um, so when we first started this research, I, uh, I consulted the Freedom House data, and there's also another index, Polity um, Four Index, which uh, it defines democracy based on uh, a number of um, kind of performance indicators, uh, say um, censorship of the media, how free and fair the elections are, um, how easy it is for all people to um, participate in general elections, but it was generally relating to elections and um, uh, uh, some other things such as media censorship, um, which I don't think is really adequate. Um, the the VDEM index is uh, better in the sense that it looks at um, kind of more aspects of demo what you might call democracy um, things like opportunities for civil society to participate and underlying levels of corruption um, which I guess one could also call uh, as institutional factors or as, as other things um, so I think as a more general point it's it's really difficult um, though very important to pin down exactly what democracy is um, uh, and how to define it um, I mean we worked we are referring to uh, some like key data sets which which are frequently used in, in political science for, for doing quantitative studies of democracy um, but in terms of uh, sort of how how satisfying we are at getting at the heart of democracy and what that means I, th I think that's uh, a much deeper conversation and um, uh, something to reflect on more Okay, then we have many, many branches to discuss. For example, Tech UK, seen from France, UK is a democracy since 200 years. Well, it's not the case of France. France were a democracy since 140 years. So it makes a big difference between these two countries. But that's not what I want to discuss. It's about uh, linking democracy and political economy. And I will use a discussion I had with the Russian economist uh, five, six years ago. And he was saying something very interesting about political economy of energy. He was saying, if you think coal mines, you are thinking about an industry with labor. And what the miners think is always influential. It does not matter what is the political regime because they are influential. If you think oil industry, it's mainly capital and government authorization. So again, it does not matter much what type of political regime you have because it won't go to 
electorate to take decisions. It will be taken by small uh, circles in, uh, in elites. So I can elaborate again more. Huh? I can add a book about uh, energy democracy in Germany. And this book was saying, well, if you think uh, onshore wind and solar, decisions are taken locally. If you are in a very decentralized state where the federal government does not do much, and even the regional governments cannot control everything, many things are decided at the municipal level, and the municipal level is big enough for wind onshore or solar, so you will get a particular type of uh, um, energy decision. So these two uh, comments I got are not saying that democracy in itself is so key. They are suggesting that the type, the regime of the energy itself is as important as the as the political regime of the territory. What do you how do you react to this question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, a very um, important and I guess uh, um, well points that that I need to go away and think about in order to to kind of address sufficiently um, the. The second point that you mentioned about uh, decentralized energy um, options such as solar and wind, um, that was something that, that came up um, in our conversations with David as well constantly about um, uh, actually because of the decentralized nature, they might, um, they might be somewhat easy, not easier, but kind of, um, well, in a way easier to, uh, to accommodate in democracies um, uh, or maybe... Also in Mongolia, inside China, Mongolia is an excess of renewable energy because the provincial government was thinking, wow, we will do it, but they have too much. So now they have to export it well, they do not know well. We have seen on the map huh, that Mongolia is, uh, is willing to do things. But uh, I'm only teasing you, uh, Zinep. Huh? Yeah, it's a really important point, I think. So perhaps looking at the the kind, as you say, the regime structure of, of energy um, rather than um, the regime in general, and what we might call a democratic regime, maybe how, um, how much room is given to um, local levels to decide and in a way maybe be uh, in line with kind of traditional definitions of democracy, more democratic by allowing local voices um, to be heard in, in areas that we might not necessarily uh, define as democratic. Um, but yes, you're giving me a lot to think about and uh, thank you. Anyway, to be a good researcher is to ask good question and your question is good. So it's a very interesting topic. And of course it, it takes time to explore it, etc. And I am afraid of David, so you can give him my uh, very best hello from Florence. <laughs> so okay. I thank the three uh, presenters. You are real researchers. You are asking new questions. You are looking at way to give answers and uh, to test the robustness of your answers. And uh, I'm very pleased to have met you. Um, if you want to interact with me again, you will uh, Google my name and you will find me easily. I'm the boss at the France School of Regulation. I love young researchers. I think that you are uh, the future of uh, knowledge. Uh, knowledge is not written in books. Knowledge is not uh, defined uh, since uh, antiquity. Knowledge is something we are creating. And you, the three of you, you are creating much more knowledge than me. Me, I am transmitting knowledge, but I'm not creating much. You are creating the knowledge. And what is fantastic, you are creating knowledge from China to US, uh, crossing Cambridge. And it's also something I love at IAEE, and David knows that, 
that uh, I love these uh, exchanges. And as I said, my uh, own sister, my own daughter, sorry, worked for 20 years in China. She's not working in China currently because with the COVID, it's more difficult for uh, foreigners to come to China and to move. But as soon as she will be able to continue, she will do again. And uh, as the researchers, we are right to meet, to discuss, to do things together, because uh, no country owns the truth and uh, nobody owns the truth. The truth is something we are building together. I wish you the best and uh, the very best. And uh, now I have to go to my own session to present my own ideas. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Zineb. Thank you. Thank you so thank much, you. Alicia. Thank you very much. And good luck. And thank you to Theo team for the help at the beginning. I, I was lost without you, Theo team. <laughs> thank you. Ciao, ciao. Thank ciao you all for your presentation. You. And thank you for attending this event. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.